All right. Well, you know, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kelly Charles, and I am the Learning Committee Chair and also an NFDA board member. And I thank you for joining us for our program today, improving the performance of your stainless steel fasteners. Our event is sponsored by Brighton Best International, an NFDA, NFDA Platinum Premier Sponsor, J. Lenfranco Fastening Systems, an NFDA Silver Premier Sponsor, Worth Industry North America, an NFDA Silver Premier Partner, Bay West Fasteners, Eurolink Fastener Supply Service, IFE Americas, Midstate Bolt and Screw, SEMS and Specials, and Vertex Distribution. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Derek Dandy. Derek is the Strategic Market Manager of Fasteners for the S3P Division of Body Coat. He is an IFI certified fastener professional with an engineering degree in material science. Derek has 15 years of experience in the fastener industry, including sales, distribution, and manufacturing. He's been with Body Coat, the S3P division for over four years and is currently responsible for global market development. Um, if you do have questions during the presentation, uh, please use the chat function and we will address those at the end. And now I will hand it over to Derek. Thank you, Kelly and Jamie and Amy <clears throat> and the rest of the NFDA folks for uh, giving us the opportunity today to uh, talk about um, stainless steel fasteners a bit, who body coat is, and you know, uh, an interesting technology that we have to offer uh, for any uh, customers utilizing stainless and other corrosion resistant alloys. So um, just a quick look and talk about who body coat is. Uh, if you're not familiar with body coat, uh, world's largest uh, thermal processing company. Um, so if you're on the manufacturing side in the fastener world, you might be outsourcing some heat treat uh, for various materials or industry standards to some of our um, locations uh, in and around North America or possibly overseas. Um, classical heat treat makes up a majority of our business, uh, but then in addition to that, we have a smaller division called the Specialist Technologies Division, which is uh, where my team falls in. Uh, so in addition to our, especially stainless steel processes or S3P as, as the acronym is, uh, we also offer hot isostatic pressing, uh, powder met form, forming, um, metal joining, as well as some other technologies as you see on the screen here, uh, ceramic coatings and things like that as well. So. Um, again, what we're going to be talking about today is a little bit of, you know, basics about uh, stainless steel fasteners, some of the challenges with stainless steel fasteners, um, and then moving into, you know, our process and then some of the particular applications that might be of interest um, to you. So let's get started here. Uh, some of this might seem very basic uh, to many of you that have been in, in the industry quite some time here, but I'm uh, not sure of the entire audience. So I wanted to really start um, at the ground level here. So um, when I, you know, ask how a threaded fastener works, uh, it seems pretty simple. You know, uh, everybody's familiar with applying some type of torque to clamp some components together. And then once they are seated together, a particular uh, torque is, is taken off of some torque tension table uh, to stretch that fastener, uh, creating a clamping force. I, I like to, to equate this to a rubber band. So, you know, again, as you stretch that rubber band, it wants to pull back on you. Same principles apply when, when you're stretching this fastener. Uh, you stretch the fastener and it wants to pull back, creating that clamp load. Again, based on the grade of the fastener, based on whatever torque you're applying, based on the size of the fastener, um, that clamp load is gonna vary uh, with all those different um, choices that are out there. And when we look at the uh, input torque here, uh, our K factor or our friction factor, and then, is multiplied by our nominal diameter. So again, half inch or 10 millimeter, and then the, your F would be your resultant clamp load. So some of the challenges when, when we look at proper installation of a fastener, um, you can have a lot of the input torque lost uh, to bearing surface friction. So again, under the head of, 
of a bolt uh, at the face of a nut, uh, at washer faces, things like that. And you're also gonna have a lot of that input torque is lost to thread friction uh, during that tightening process. Uh, you're only gonna end up with 10, sometimes 15, depending on what, what eye chart you're looking at here, but a very small percentage of the actual input torque translates into useful clamping force. So as you can see, 90% of the input torque is, is, is really impacted by friction. So friction definitely plays a big role in proper fastener installation. Now, when we look at, at clamp load targets, um, if you're talking about steel fasteners or lubricated stainless steel fasteners, you can utilize about 75% of the material's yield strength. And then if you actually look at dry stainless steel fasteners, you can only use about 40% of the material's yield strength. So you're, you're only getting about half of, of the potential um, out of that material. So that's definitely a big challenge um, for, us to, for us to deal with. So what's the driving principle between why only 40% in dry condition versus 75% in a lubricated condition? So stainless steel, and when I say stainless steels, I'm referring to your standard uh, 300 series materials that, that we work with a lot, as well as some of the more exotic uh, nickel-based alloys, Inconels, Hast alloys, and duplex materials as well. So these materials are, we all know that they're corrosion resistant, uh, and that's from a passive oxide layer on its surface. Uh, stainless steels are self-passivating, so once they're manufactured, uh, they're going to create that layer on their own. Uh, a lot of times manufacturers will send them through a specific passivation process uh, to clean that surface as much as possible. Uh, and then upon installation of these fasteners, uh, the, the friction that's occurring can deform, break uh, this oxide layer. And now what you have is exposed uh, bare stainless steel. And when you get two stainless steel surfaces with this oxide layer that's removed, you're going to start to get surface wear. 300 series stainless steels especially, uh, very soft materials. They're not put through any type of heat treating processes. So they're an as manufactured and they're always in a soft state. So when you have this uh, surface wear that occurs, your, the friction that I was talking about before goes up significantly. And when that friction goes up significantly, now you, now you start to get very inconsistent clamp loads. So are your fasteners even installed properly? And if, if you continue to tighten these fasteners too much, you can get seized joints or galling as it's commonly referred to. And if you continue to push the limits, you can end up with broken fasteners, broken bolts that now have to be uh, drilled out or what have you, or possibly cause more catastrophic failures due to the bolted joint failing. So some of the other common issues that occur when we work with stainless steels, they're typically used in sensitive environments. So they might be used in medical devices. They might be used in electronics packaging. They might be used in food and beverage equipment. Um, the go-to is typically a WD-40, some type of anti-seize paste, some type of anti-seize coating. Um, but unfortunately, when you're talking about some of these more sensitive environments, lubricants are not an option because they can cause contamination. Um, th those types of environments can have the, the risks of uh, bringing something else in, into the uh, application. So some of the other challenges it, uh, that, that stainless steel fasteners face, uh, if you have prevailing torque fasteners such as lock nuts or uh, different types of um, lock washers, anytime that you're uh, introducing excess stress levels, uh, you have a chance of increasing how fast this galling and seizing can occur with, fast, with threaded fasteners. High speed installation. So if you're talking about stainless steel fasteners being used uh, in an assembly environment, um, nobody wants in an assembly environment to be using hand tools, right? Everybody wants to install these things as fast as possible and get the products made. So high speed installation is also a challenge as well as if you have long rundown. So if you have some large threaded areas, that excess friction uh, is just gonna get worse over time as you run those fasteners together. And as I mentioned before, uh, lubricants are very, very common. 
not can't be used in all sorts of environments though. So an example uh, from a clamp load perspective, if you have an M8 fastener in a lubricated condition, you can generate roughly 2,800 pounds of clamping force. In a dry condition, you can only generate about 1,500 pounds of clamp force using that same fastener. So as you can see, you're sacrificing roughly half of the usability of this fastener. So what does this mean? Uh, if you're set on using M8 fasteners, you're gonna have to use a lot more of them. Or if you have the option, you can go to larger fasteners. So, you know, again, more fasteners are going to drive more, more drilled and tapped holes from a manufacturing standpoint. Larger fasteners are going to carry larger associated costs. So another challenge that, that occurs uh, when we start talking about stainless steel fasteners. So um, moving into what my group within Body Coat does offer, um, we offer something that's very unique. Um, to, to 300 series stainless steels, as well as some of these other nickel-based alloys. Um, the process is called colsterizing, um, and I'm just going to walk you through a couple steps of, of what this process is. So this first image in the top left would be your base stainless steel with those blue circles uh, indicating that, that chrome oxide passive layer that I mentioned before, giving the stainless steel its corrosion-resistant properties. Uh, one of the first steps in our process is to remove that chrome oxide layer or activate the surface a, a, as we call it. In that third image you'll see here, um, we are diffusing ex, excuse me, excess levels of carbon uh, into the base material. And then one of the last steps in our process is to reestablish that chrome oxide passive layer. So again, uh, no, no farm materials are being added. Carbon is already present in stainless steel. So uh, getting back to the sensitive environments and applications, uh, no concerns in regards to uh, foreign materials. So if we took a closer look at what a material or part, a fastener, whatever it might be, looks like post-process, uh, the top part of this image shows uh, a very high carbon content that slowly falls off as you move through that hardened layer. And the hardness follows suit. So a very high hardness at the surface. And as you move through that hardened layer, the hardness gradually falls off. So one of the great things there is it's very hard at the surface, but not brittle. So we don't have to worry about this layer chipping or cracking or flaking off. One, because of this hardness profile, it remains ductile. Second, everything that we're doing is subsurface. So as opposed to like a plating or a coating or a nitriding, all those types of processes are additive processes that are sitting on the surface. So this process is 100% subsurface. Oops. One of the other keys here uh, to keep in mind, we do this at low temperature. And when we say low temperature, we mean under 500 degrees Celsius. And the key there is that we're able to not have an impact um, with the excess carbon and the chrome at the surface. So chrome is important to maintain the corrosion resistance. So we're not having any impact there. So once you receive these parts back, they're gonna have that same level of corrosion resistance as, as they did prior to um, our process. So what does that mean for you and your fasteners, your customers' fasteners? Uh, more consistent clamp load is probably the biggest one, um, regardless of the installation method, um, regardless of how fast they get installed, uh, and being able to be used in a dry condition. So when these go out to the, to, you know, to assembly or out into the field, you don't have to worry about who's using them. They're all going to perform exactly the same way. And there's some images here uh, that are very telling. So on the left-hand image, you have an untreated fastener that was tightened to an industry recommended torque value. And you can see the surface wear that occurs on the flanks. That was at 54 foot pounds. And on the right hand side, you see a fastener that was treated by us. That was then torqued to 135 foot pounds with zero indication of any type of surface wear. So very telling images there. And on the bottom, uh, this is actually third-party information that was provided to us from a customer. This is Hastelloy 
uh, C276. And on the left-hand side in red, you see how consistent of a clamp load uh, their, their posterized fasteners uh, performed versus how versus the scatter in the untreated condition in the showing the gray dots. So again, why, why is this process important to fasteners? Eliminate surface wear, eliminates galling, uh, improves your torque tension relationship, which is always something very important for proper bolted joint design. Uh, fatigue strength. So this isn't something that comes into account a lot when it comes to threaded fasteners per se, but when it does come into account with uh, springs and other types of retaining clips, which I'll touch on in a little bit as well. The entire fastener is treated with no change in dimensions. So anybody that's in, ever installed a fastener, you typically take your NICs, your lubricant, and you apply it to the threads only. Well, that still doesn't take into account one of the other big losses, which is under the face of the the bolt at the face of the nut as well, or at the washer interfaces. So every surface gets treated in, a, in this process with it being a bolt process. Maintain the optical appearance of stainless steel. So typically stainless steel fasteners are gonna be used to assemble stainless steel components. So you're not, we're not adding any color, any, any uh, yellow tint or purple or black, what have you. So these fasteners are gonna, um, blend right into the rest of the components that they're being used with. And then, as I mentioned, there's no lubricants, no foreign materials, non-toxic non -toxic can be used in sensitive environments. Uh, we do have an FDA master file. So when it comes to direct food contact, uh, medical uh, components, whether they be implants, whether they be just being used on medical devices, uh, we're currently working in all those environments um, currently. So just again, wanted to touch on a couple different types of fastener applications. Locking fasteners is one that we have great success with. Uh, so again, used in high vibration applications. Uh, the locking feature, whether it's a washer style, uh, some type of alternative thread profile, um, some type of deformed top lock nut, what have you. But that locking feature is created by high localized stress points. And as I mentioned before, when you start assembling fasteners that have those types of uh, additional stresses, uh, you have an even greater chance of galling and seizing of those joints. And at some point you can actually lose the entire locking function. So again, we can treat uh, all fat types of fastener designs uh, with this being a bulk process. We can treat internally threaded parts as well as we can treat externally threaded parts. Again, another advantage over coatings and platings that do have challenges with trying to get into deep blind threaded holes. Uh, another one is the locking fasteners can be reused. Um, so they're not gonna lose that functionality that first time that they get used. And there's currently a couple of different types of locking fasteners out there that are only offered in alloy steel. And with a process like this, it gives you the opportunity to, to expand into stainless steels uh, as well. Uh, vented screws, we, we treat a lot of these currently. Um, they're used in, again, high vacuum, ultra high vacuum environments, semiconductor, clean room uh, type of environment. So again, contamination uh, is something they're very concerned with um, and we're able to uh, provide them a fastener that introduces, again, no contamination as well as uh, repeatable uh, clamp load. Uh, set screws. Um, so th th this one is almost twofold. So set screws, sometimes they're installed once to just stop relative motion between components. Sometimes they're actually used as an adjustment screw. So a lot of times they're tightened, they're loosened, they're tightened repeatedly. So you start to get that, that surface wear that occurs at the threads. And then in addition to the surface wear at the threads, you can actually get a loss of holding power. So we did some testing last year um, which showed significant improvements uh, with set screws, anywhere between 40 and 50% uh, increase in holding power of um, 316 uh, cup point set screws. So another interesting application that we've shown um, pretty significant success with. 
And last two, we're gonna to touch on fatigue. So with retaining clips, the, the different styles that you see here, uh, these are manufactured by some type of stamping operation. Um, from that stamping operation, you're going to get micro cracks either on the outside diameter, on the inside diameter, or at any one of those, those surfaces. And those micro cracks over time can end up leading to uh, fatigue failure. Um, so we, we have a couple applications that we work on currently today where we treat these uh, different types of clips after the fact and show significant improvements uh, in fatigue performance. And the next one that we're currently completing a test program with are our springs. So as you can imagine, springs can fail over time due to fatigue load or fatigue uh, cycling. Um, so based on some of the, the, the mechanics behind our process, we can improve the fatigue life significantly. And one of the other things to consider, there's two images here on the right hand side, uh, cross sections of a spring. You'll notice that black circle represents our colsterized layer. So regardless of the cross section of the part, the, the, the colsterized layer is gonna be the same size. So as companies continue to move to smaller and smaller components, uh, the smaller the spring, the higher of, of an improvement that, that we will um, show. So uh, in, in summary here, uh, we're gonna be able to treat the entire fastener. So again, under the head in blind holes, um, internal threaded components uh, with no dimensional changes. So there's no concessions that have to be taken as with some other platings and coatings. Eliminate surface wear, and then we go on down the line. Surface wear is eliminated. You get a more consistent coefficient of friction, more consistent clamp load and an overall better bolted joint design. As I mentioned here with the improved torque tension relationship, uh, increased fatigue strength for those non-threaded type of applications. And then again, based on the, the nature of this process uh, with, with no uh, contaminating, contaminating materials, we can be used in all sorts of critical types of environments. We do have an FDA master file if you know you have some interest or your customers have interest in hearing more about that. And then here's also some other directives um, that we meet um, as well. So um, again, you know, always looking for new applications, currently working on various projects with, with some different customers, whether they're developing new types of fastener uh, designs. Um, we're working on some projects with end users. Um, so, you, you know, we have the flexibility and we're always looking to, you know, engage with anyone there out in the field that's bringing us challenges and that, you know, we can potentially work with you to, to develop something or some type of solution um, for your customer. And that might be through reuse of fasteners, uh, investigating more exotic material systems. Obviously, as these fasteners get expensive, it would be nice to be able to, to reuse them. And then replacing some of these field applied lubricants and dry films and waxes and things like that that do cause some variability um, out there in the field. Um, I will be sending this presentation out. So it's got my contact information here at the end. Um, so anybody can feel free to reach out to me after the fact if you needed some additional information or if there's something that you, you had some interest in pursuing. Um, and that's all I had to share. Um, Kelly, not sure if there were any questions that, that ended up coming in here that, that needed answering. Yeah, so far we have one. Um, is there any change in appearance of the stainless steel after colsterizing? There can be. Um, uh, typically there's nothing significant. Um, we do get some impact to the optical appearance based on how we're receiving um, the parts in. So if there's extreme levels of cold work, there can be um, some slight variation um, in the, op I'm gonna go back here to this set screw slide here, because I think this one showed it a little bit here. But from the perspective of, it's not going to be a different color as, as with a coating or anything like that. So 
On the left-hand side here, you see an untreated set screw, and on the right-hand side, you see a treated set screw. So that, that would be worst case scenario from an optical appearance standpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, can you address the effectiveness of this coating on internal threads? Uh, yeah, uh, we have customers that will come to us with a through-hole design. So they have a bolt and they have a nut and then they'll come to us and say, hey, which one of these should I be treating? And typically what we do is we'll treat both components and they'll just run a test matrix and say, um, they'll, they'll run the bolt, the treated bolt with an untreated nut, untreated bolt with a treated nut, and then we'll, they'll run them together. And typically there's, there's negligible um, differences um, between those three data points. Um, we are also in the process of doing some internal testing as well. And our intention is to test those three uh, setups as well. But there is no, going to be no difference Can, since the treatment is effective on, on those internal threads as well. Uh, the, the improvement is, is the same. All right, thank you. Uh, can colsterizing be used in place of B8M bolts? So uh, B8M, uh, so with, with our process here, uh, we are not improving the overall mechanical strength of the 316. So it's going to have the same bulk material properties as when you started. Um, so if you're looking for a stronger 316 using colsterizing wouldn't get you there. Uh, we have had customers use 300 series fasteners um, plus colsterizing to replace uh, nitronic 50 and 60 materials. So they get a more readily available fastener uh, that they'll then outperform nitronic materials. Okay. Uh, Mark, did that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, can you black oxide over the top of a treated part? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. And we tip, we do have some customers that end up going through some type of color and after the fact um, for, an, for identification purposes. Okay. Um, from a cost standpoint, is it less costly to treat uh, the nuts versus the bolts? Uh, I would say yes, and only because they weigh, they weigh less. They're smaller parts. So being a bulk process, as with other uh, post processes in the fastener industry. Um, we do have a different couple different flavors of colsterizing um, and what we choose to quote our customers based on either the application and or the base material. But at the end of the day, it does come down to a dollar per pound rate. And typically the your hex nut is going to be smaller than your bolt. So with, with that theory, those would be less money to treat. Okay. Uh, is there a test that can be performed on treated parts to confirm that the part has been colsterized? Yes. So um, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation here, um, it's a very shallow case depth. We're on the order of microns. Um, so if some, when we've had this happen a, a, a thousand times, we will send some parts back and uh, the customer will put them on their Rockwell C um, hardness tester and they'll say, you didn't treat my parts. In reality, all that's happened then is it's pushed the hardened layer back into the base material. So if any, if any hardness testing is gonna be done, um, it has to be done with the micro hardness scale. And if you're just looking for something rudimentary, we just have customers that sometimes grab a file and they'll hit the edge of the part with a file and, and they can judge whether it's been treated or not. But yes, you can hardness test after the fact. Okay, thank you. Um, since this increases the outer shell hardness, does this improve thread forming, thread cutting, screw performance? Has this been done or tested? It's a great question. So um, before my time, I know there was some folks that looked into um, 300 series stainless steel tech screws. Uh, typically tech screws are 400 series uh, through hardened, and then they get a coating put on them. Um, but there has been some investigation into tech screws, and we have had some talks about trying to run some type of test program with 
again, say thread cutting or some type of thread forming uh, screw as well. But nothing um, at this point to be able to give any um, definitive answers on. But yes, uh, in theory, we'll, we should see some type of improvement. Um, what minimum and maximum batch sizes are possible for culturizing? We have some customers that hand us a handful of parts. So in some industries, they're constantly just project-based or ordering one bill of materials at a time. We'll have some customers send us six fasteners, uh, two fasteners. Um, and then we'll have uh, some customers that will load up a whole batch. Uh, in one of our batches, we can run approximately 500 pounds at a time. Mm -hmm. um, are there multiple facilities offering this process? And does Body Coat have licensees? So here in North America, uh, our first original plant is in London, Ohio, right outside of Columbus. Uh, and then about three years ago, we opened up a facility uh, in Mooresville, North Carolina, which is right outside of Charlotte. Um, due to the COVID pandemic, um, we shifted all the Mooresville work excuse me, back to Ohio. So those are our two in North America. And then we have five facilities over in Europe as well. And those are all wholly owned body coat facilities. With this being a proprietary process, there have been no licensees for it. Okay. Um, now, these are not normal times by any stretch of the imagination, but as far as, you know, turnaround time, lead time, what, yep. um, what is normal? Uh, 10 business days is about normal. Um, a lot of that is just the nature of the process being a, a, a slow process. Okay. All right. Well, I am caught up to all the questions that are, oh, I was caught up. Um, are there any RPM limitations? Can an impact driver be used? Um, please repeat if already mentioned. Yeah, that was something that, you know, that I, I had mentioned that's one of the typical challenges with uh, stainless steel fasteners is the rate of installation. Um, and that's one of the things that we can help help eliminate here with the with that increased surface hardness. Okay. All right. Um, We'll give it another minute here in case anybody is inspired with another question. Okay. Um, if you perform this on the nut, do you need to do it on the bolt as well? Is it more effective if you do both the bolt and the nut? It's a good question. So um, you're going to get the same performance if you do if you treat the bolt and an untreated nut or, or an untreated bolt with the treated nut, you're going to get the same performance. Um, we have had some customers come to us and say they get a little bit, quote unquote, better performance if you treat both. Uh, but typically, most customers get away with, with just treating one. And then it's a matter of what their application is. They might have some studs that are pressed into some components, so therefore, that they have to treat the nut, or they might have some blind threaded holes in a machined part, so therefore they have to treat the bolt. But just treating one of the components would get you um, maximized performance. Okay. All right. Um, here's one more. Um, could the process improve the performance of a 410 stainless steel tech screw? So unfortunately, this process is for austenetic materials. So 300 series, ink and L's, Hastelloy's, uh, A286. Um, we do have a process specific for duplex. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to treat uh, Martin Siddick or 400 series uh, or your Furidic 400 series materials uh, with this process. Okay. All right. Uh, what is your policy for providing samples? Um, do you have a minimum? We do have a minimum. Our, our minimum lot charge uh, is, is pretty reasonable in the heat treat uh, world. 
Um, but again, you know, we're willing to work with anybody if, you know, if, if we need to. Okay. Um, does the process increase corrosion resistance? It's not going to increase the corrosion resistance. Our goal is to be able to maintain the corrosion resistance because at the end of the day, that, that chrome oxide passive layer is the same pre and post colsterizing. So we're not doing anything to, to further enhance um, that characteristic. Okay. All right. All right, last call. Okay. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions, I guess we could wrap it up. Um, Derek, did you have anything else uh, that you'd like to add? Uh, no, uh, like I said, again, after you have a chance to digest some of this information, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out. Um, I will be sending a copy in PDF form uh, to be distributed um, as well. And sure. yeah, if there's any, again, additional questions, anything you might feel like uh, would be a good opportunity for us to explore together, let me know. All right, good. All right, well, we will be sending out a survey um, via email. Please do uh, give us feedback, not only on this presentation, but also if there's any other um, technical presentations or topics that are of interest to you. Um, we wanna make sure that we're giving you, you know, good engaging information. Um, and as Derek said, we're gonna be sending you the link to the recording and a PDF of the presentation when that's available. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. Um, we hope to see everybody at our next program on May 12th. We are co-branding with YFP um, and it, uh, the topic is sales differentiation, win more deals at the prices you want with Lee Saltz of Sales Architects. Uh, the registration is open. Um, so thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Derek.